Welcome to the Midday News on 3FM 92.7. We're live from our studios here at Adesawe Kanda Accra. This afternoon, 10 days the December 7 general elections. What factors will inform your choice? At the polls, we'll engage our correspondents across the country. Also, Electoral Commission holds meeting with journalists aimed at equipping them ahead of the crucial December 7 elections. Plus, Mortuary Workers Association of Ghana threatening to resume strike tomorrow to demand better conditions of service. My name is Grace Hamwajuman. Details of this and more shortly. Stay with us. Many thanks for joining us. Let's begin the bulletin right now. And the Electoral Commission is holding the last of meetings with journalists aimed at equipping them ahead of the crucial December elections. Media coverage of the December elections has come under some scrutiny following plans by the Electoral Commission to restrict coverage at constituency and regional coalition centers to credible media outlets. My colleague Eric Marinagbeta has been sitting through that meeting and will join us later with details of that. But first, let's also go to the voter region because ballot materials for the presidential and parliamentary elections have arrived in the voter region ahead of the December 7 polls. The materials were received at the headquarters of the Volta Regional Police Command in Ho Tuesday night under strict security protection. Correspondent Faisal Abdul Idrisu is currently at the Regional Police headquarters in Ho and joins us with update on this development. While we work the phone to, well, Faisal, if you can hear me now, bring us up to speed on how these materials were received in the region. Faisal, if you can hear me, update us on how these materials were re received in the region. Well, so the materials were brought here to the police headquarters last night at about 10 p.m. and then this morning. Uh, the various political parties in the uh, uh, election directors from across the constituencies who are here to first and foremost sort the bags into the various constituencies. Underway is the counting of uh, the ballots to be sure that they have the adequate numbers they are to receive, after which the item to be sent back to the police headquarters armory. We are told that because the special vote is on Monday, 2nd December, uh, material for that election will be sent to the district police command ahead of Monday, after which those for the general election on December 7th would also be sent. Yes. Yes, Faisal, we're aware political party representatives sound the ground. Have you been able to speak to any of them? What have they been telling you? Yeah, so I, I spoke to both the NDC and the MPP. Uh, they told us that they are monitoring this process uh, very keenly. They want to be sure that everything is in place. And uh, for the NDC in particular, they mentioned that once they are satisfied with the process, they are sure that the results on December 7 will be accepted by all. I spoke to the regional secretary for both of the political parties, Hope Yavu of the NDC and James Kunu of the NDC. Well, we can listen to them now. Uh, so far, so good. I think there's uh, a large collaboration between all the stakeholders here, the security services, the electoral commission, uh, the MPP, the NDC, and other independent uh, who are here. I think there's uh, a maximum, uh, if not total, collaboration uh, amounts, amounts of all of us. Now that we are done with the sorting of the parts to every constituency, now we now we do a step ahead, open the bags, uh, work statistics, and then uh, before we can do. So, like you said, it's going to be an all day affair. It's going to be a busy day. Pope Yao Yavo, the NPP Volta Regional Secretary, will bring you the audio of James Gunu, who is the NDC, also the Volta Regional Secretary, on how they are working to protect these ballot materials that have been received in the region. Faisal, my colleague from the 
Volta Region has been updating us. Faisal, thank you for bringing us those updates. Let's to stay with the issues on election. And in just 10 days, eligible Ghanaian voters will go to the polls to decide who leads the country for the next four years. But let's quickly touch base with our reporters who are the various parts of the region to bring us how it looks like in the various regions. Castro Senyala is my colleague from the Upper East region. He has details on how it is panning out in the region. Castro, if you can hear me, bring us details on how the region is faring when it comes to the election. All right. One we're not able to connect with Castro, we'll bring that subsequently. But talking about the election, we know there are some regions that have been described as decider regions when it comes to who wins the election. And the significance of the Greater Akka region cannot be overstated as a 2024 polls approach. A bellwether region, the Greater Accra, has the largest voter concentration swung between the two major political parties and on many occasions decided the winner of the presidential race. Here is a report. I put together to tell us why the region remains an ultimate battleground. It all begins in Accra. Greater Accra has long been pivotal to presidential candidates who have a real chance at a win. This is where the campaign starts and sometimes ends. It is home to the national capital and government business. This is the Kingmaker region. The Greater Accra region is considered a swing region in Ghanaian politics. Since 1996, the National Democratic Congress, NDC, has won in the region four times, while the new patriotic party, NPP, has won thrice. Winning the Greater Accra region is often seen as crucial to securing victory in the national election. Pollster Musa Dankwa of Global Info Analytics explains why. Before 2020 uh, elections, Ashanti region was the big or the largest region with the most voting population. But because of COVID, and what happened, and they need to do a new register. Greater mm. Accra had overcome Ashanti region, as a region with the largest population. This is because the voters that live here, that usually go to, to vote at the register and vote, stayed in Accra because of the pandemic mm -hmm. restrictions, so they couldn't go. So we saw a movement of vote from uh, voter region into Greater Accra. That's what made Greater Accra the largest voting population. Data shows that in the last 30 years, every party that has won the Greater Accra region has gone on to win the presidency, except for 2020, when the NDC's John Dramani Mahama won the region but lost the national election to Nanado Dankwa Kufuadu by 73,310 votes. In presidential races, no candidate has won the region by 60% or more since 1996. In the 2020 elections, the NDC won the region with 51% and the NPP had 48%. But the two main parties going into the 2024 elections are poised of clinching more votes. While the NDC is targeting a 70% win. At least almost 70%, you wait and see. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sure this that's number. I'm telling you, look, things are bad in this country. And I'm sure we can make 70% from Greater Accra. The NPP says it won't be too much to ask for an 80% win from the people of the Greater Accra region. There are several uh, factors that inform voters' decisions. And so it may not be mere uh, development. If that's the case, then I would say that we'll not be wrong in asking that they should be able to say I equal to us by giving us a minimum of 80% of the vote. The Greater Accra region, though the smallest in land area, is the most populous, boasting of 3.7 million voters with 34 constituencies. Looking ahead to the 2024 election, the two main candidates, former President John Dramani Mahama of the NDC and Vice President Dr. Mahoum Balmia of the NPP, hope to win over all three million voters and clinch the Kingmaker region.
Well, we will see how it will pan out this year in the Greater Accra region as well as all the other regions and swing regions of interest. Let us now connect with our reporters and correspondents in the various regions. Let's begin from the Apa East region. St. Castro Senyala is joining us. Castro, we're just a few days away. What issues dominate in your region and consequences ahead of the crucial elections? Great, great. Uh, in the Apa East region, a lot of issues uh, dominate the conversation as far as the road to uh, the general elections uh, is concerned. Uh, topmost on these concerns uh, is youth unemployment. And so um, the residents here are looking forward to a government that would uh, champion uh, creating avenues for the teaming youth in the region to get um, employment opportunities. Uh, they say there are a lot of youth uh, who are uh, uh, going about idle and have nothing to do. And so a government which is able to create opportunities so that all these youth uh, can get places to fix themselves would uh, be the one they will vote for. They take, for example, in Boko, where uh, the conflict has been uh, long uh, happening and keeps reoccurring. Residents believe that if the youth had something to do, especially jobs, they wouldn't be uh, conduit for the violence that is happening because uh, most of those who usually get involved in the violence in Boko uh, uh, later discovered to be used most of the time. Another issue that has got to do with, uh, I mean, uh, uh, that is on the lips of residents, has to do with good roads. You know, in the Upper East region, uh, is a hub of uh, agricultural activities. Talk of the tunnel dump, the via dump, and um, the uh, problem of multiple dump that we uh, suspected to be completed. Mm. Uh, the residents believe that a government should focus on roads, build a lot of more trouble roads, so that farm produce, uh, when harvested, can be able to be uh, transported to the region, which mm. is uh, the regional capital of Bogotanga, and further out of the region for uh, the national uh, market. These and more, uh, uh, I mean, are some of the things that residents have been sharing, and also security. The issue of security is also very paramount. Uh, already, the atmosphere in the upper region is tense because of the Boku issue, and so residents are looking forward to a government that would be able to resolve the Boku issue and return mm -hmm. the region back to its old uh, haven, uh, uh, haven that it has always known to be, so that uh, development can be maximized. Back All to you, Grace. Right. All right, Great. Castro, thank you for those updates. Let us go to the Ashanti region now. My colleague Ibrahim Abubakar is also standing by. Ibrahim, you have also been engaging some electorates there. What have they been telling you with just 10 days to the election? Well, Grace, I'm in Ashanti region. Um, despite earlier polls that um, there is high voter apathy here, and the people I spoke to and, uh, today, uh, you could observe that they are geared up for the election. In fact, Others are even hoping that December 7th will be tomorrow. But basically or largely, the discussions are centered around economic growth, unemployment, and also infrastructure development. You know, for the people of Ashanti region, because um, this is a stronghold of the ruling New Patriotic Party, even though the government has done, um, has brought some form of development, uh, most of them needed more than what the government has done and also issue of unemployment they are looking at and the government that will come and address all these issues but um, basically i engage um electorate on whether they are ready for december um, elections december 7 election and whether they have decided on who to vote for let's listen to what they've been telling me uh, it's a must for everybody to vote it's necessary so I've decided I will vote, but for me, I will not vote for NDC or MPP. They've done their part, so they should give a way for the independent candidate or the minor or the smaller parties to also come and do their best. So that we see, we try them and see if they also come and then they are not able to help and then we know that Ghana, our politician cannot help us. In fact, I was thinking today is December 7th because my card is here, <laughs> right? So I am ready and prepared to vote against MPP this election. It's not about free SHS. It is about the hardship and the economy problem that Bawomia and his associate has created for us. So I believe as a Ghanaian, it's my right and my responsibility to vote for who I think will help Ghana to grow. So yes, of course, I'm prepared. 
uh, we all want the betterment of Ghana. So whoever we think that will come and then help Ghana to grow, that is what we are looking for. Yes, Ibrahim. So we also know that the president is in the region. And then there's been a video of how frantic work is going on at the KJTR market. Update us on how residents in the region are reacting to this. Well, uh, obviously, um, like I said, because this is the stronghold of the new patriotic party, so you would expect that um, massive welcome of the president to the region. In fact, he has been here for three days, commissioning project and also... Um, um, canvassing for vote for the new patriotic party. Uh, now the um, second phase of the KJTR market work started some few um, weeks ago, but yesterday um, actually some were surprised because uh, it started with skeletal staff who were there working. But yesterday you could see that um, the number of workers had I'm increased. increased. The regional minister has already um, announced that the project may not be completed mm. by the close of this year, but they've pushed it to 2025 because of delays. In fact, right. for more than a year, the project uh, has been there um, without any activity ongoing. But okay. like I said, even though we have other section of the people who appreciative of the kind of development the mm. government has done. Mm. Others also believe that the, the government could have do more, especially completing the second phase of, of the, the KJTR market, market and, and also even the Confanochi MD. Yeah. All right, Ibrahim, thank you for bringing us those details. Ibrahim Abubakar, my colleague in the Ashanti region. Let us come back to the Great Aqua region and talk about that training by the Electoral Commission with journalists aimed at equipping them ahead of the crucial December elections. My colleague Eric Mawena Egbeta has been sitting through that meeting and joins us. Mawena, why has it become important for the EC to organize this meeting with just 10 days to the election? Well, um, uh, Grace, thank you. They've been seeking to provide a bit more education, a bit more clarity uh, to journalists who will be front and center in the elections because they will convey whatever is happening across different parts of the country, 276 uh, constituencies, 40,000 plus polling stations. The expectation is that for, for these journalists, they'll be uh, abreast with uh, everything that will, will happen in relation to the election and be and be able to communicate as much as possible accurately what's happening. Also do away with a lot of uh, misinformation, which has sadly uh, generated some roots in the last few days uh, in relation to, to when and where voting is expected to take place. And so interestingly as well, the Electoral Commission's Director of Training, uh, Dr. Spribo Kweku as well, has been explaining uh, reforms that has been introduced by the Electoral Commission, particularly at coalition centers at the constituency level, where we will see at the at the constituency level in previous elections where when results were announced, counting and sorting was all done at the polling station, the presiding officer moves to the coalition center with the ballot box and everything, that will no longer be a, a thing going forward in the elections. The presiding officer, if the election results are not challenged, will move to the coalition center only with the pink sheet and enable coalition to take place from there. And so that's the latest reform which is expected. It's expected to decongest the coalition centers uh, following what was witnessed during the 2020 uh, general elections where violence uh, mark certain areas, mm. all of that and more is expected to be one of the things which can decongest these areas to allow for a smoother process during this election, Grace. So, Mana, that means the EC is still justifying its reason to restricting the number of reporters at the coalition centre, even though there's been some form of backlash with the decision? Well, officially on this, at this particular place, there's not been uh, direct communication or response to that, mm. but Officially as well, from the electoral, the quarters of the electoral commission, the headquarters itself, there's been a statement that's been issued uh, which says that there's ongoing conversations between the Ghana Journalists Association and the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association as well to find 
uh, a way to go about it following the backlash. The commission says they are listening commission. And so the conversation is ongoing as to what fruits it will yield. Well, we are waiting to see mm. that and then we can see what transpires going forward. But unofficially, there's been conversations and questions asked as to what the Electoral Commission is seeking to do. Even here, amongst journalists, they've sought to ask that question and sought to get explanation. Mm. But uh, perhaps now, the only official communication is that statement which has been issued by the Electoral Commission. Grace. Right, man. I will definitely come back to you when the EC is able to officially respond to that question on the mind of everybody, especially journalists in the country. Thank you for bringing us those details. My colleague, Eric Mawena Egbeta, bringing us those details. Still with election, though, rejected ballots often rank among the highest vote totals right after the major political parties. This, according to election watchers, constitute a significant blot on voter education among the populace. With just 10 days to go until the December 7 elections, Enyonam Haliga in today's election nuggets will focus on how you can avoid having your vote declared as a rejected ballot. It's 10 days to the December 7 general election, and this is your daily election nuggets. Did you know rejected ballots accounts for nearly third highest vote after the NPP and the NDC in every election? In 2008, rejected ballots, if valid, could have prevented a runoff. What if I told you there's a chance you could contribute in reducing the number of rejected ballots this year? Ghana's electoral laws allow sport ballots to be replaced. And then you may ask, what are sport ballots? Sports ballot is a paper that's swallowed in one way or the other by ink, torn across or crumpled, and has not been placed in the ballot box. Well, if you happen to find yourself in a situation where your ballot is sold in one way, return the said ballot paper to the returning officer at your polling station and have a new ballot paper returned to you. Always make sure that your ballot paper has a stamp of the Electoral Commission on this before proceeding to cast your votes. This ensures your vote when eventually cast and dropped in the ballot box is not marked as registered, as rejected during sorting and counting. Protect your vote and make sure you go out to vote. That's it on today's edition of the Daily Election Nuggets here on your Election Command Centre. So now... You know what to do so that your ballot is not considered a rejected ballot. This is the Midday News on 3FM 92.7. Stories we have brought you so far with 10 days, the December 7 general elections. We have been finding out from our reporters and the various readings on what is deciding or informing the decision of voters on who to vote for. And also we told you about that crucial meeting that the Electoral Commission is holding with journalists aimed at equipping them ahead of the crucial December 7 election. Let us talk about something not related to elections because this afternoon the Mortuary Workers Association is threatening to resume a strike action to demand better conditions of service starting tomorrow, November 28. The association says it has come to this decision because DR employers have not attended to their needs. A letter addressed to the Minister of Health and other stakeholders signed by the General Secretary Richard Kofi Jordan explained that Despite their efforts to reach a mutually acceptable end, the issue that lets the initial strike action remain unsolved. We have been left with no choice but to take this decision to protect the interests of our members. And so that is the reason they are given to justify why they will be embarking on a strike starting tomorrow. We'll work the phone to speak to Richard Kofi. Jordan, who is the general secretary of the group, and then he will talk to us more on why this has become important. We know that they earlier mentioned they were going on strike and they had an engagement with government, and now this is what is coming out of it. We'll look at that later. Let us still stay with issues related to health, and all is set for the roll-up of the government's free dialysis program. The program is scheduled to run in about 40 selected health facilities at an estimated cost of 20 to 57 million annually. The CEO of the National Health Insurance Scheme, Dr. Abuajeda Costa, at a joint press briefing with heads of some selected health facilities assured Ghanaians of their readiness. I can confidently say that the NHI will be able to fund dialysis in this country over many years. It is sustainable on the NHI and we are committing 
we are committed to improving, um, obviously working with the facilities to also make, deliver the service. Our current budget, even if we are not uncapped, because taxes are overperforming, is expected to be about 8 point something billion and we will cover this under our benefit package. So there shouldn't be any problem. Chief Executive of the National Health Insurance Scheme, Dr. Dacosta Abuaje there, and climate change continues to pose challenges to both the environment and governance systems worldwide, and Ghana is no exception. Journalists gathered in Accra for a media training and symposium focused on addressing these pressing issues aimed to strengthen climate reporting in Ghana by linking climate change and democracy. Speaking at the event, the Chief Executive of the Accra Metropolitan Assembly, Elizabeth Saki, aired the media to ensure the report on climate issues are credible and impactful. I'm so proud of you. I'm so grateful to you that you are here this afternoon to at least learn, have a little, I have some idea about what is climate change. I think this is the best time. I'm so happy and proud to see you. And I really think that it is an enjoyable time for you to absorb all that to be said here so that you can go back and report exactly what is affecting our climate. And uh, I first and foremost started with source separation, which I was very keen on, with the person presents us. And don't twist it, because twisting it will let the person also think like I thought, but at the end it wasn't so. So let us prove to the world and the CEO of the AMA, Elizabeth Saki there, the Metropolitan Head of Waste Management at AMA, Engineer Solomon Noy, also encouraged the media to act as advocates for climate change, emphasizing the importance of promoting equitable development and protecting Ghana's democracy. The issue is, if we pretend it doesn't exist, we will be creating more of the activities that are generating or leading to excess generation of the gases that will lead to more changes in the climate. And as a result, we cannot contain the impact of flooding, housing, desertification, and so on and so forth. So what we can do is, in our own little way, to advise and become advocacy agents. So a simple behavioral change, I'm sure we'll come to that, then, is if we leave solid waste, organic solid waste, unattended to or not managed professionally, it leads to the production of one of the greenhouse gases, which is called methane. And methane happens to be the gas that has the highest global warming potential whereas carbon dioxide is also a greenhouse gas, but it has a, the lowest global warming potential. So by just managing our waste properly within the communities, it will impact positively and not be emitting the methane. Metropolitan Head of Waste Management at the AMA, Engineer Solomon Noy, ending the midday news on 3FM 92.7. My name is Grace Hamwa Ajuman. Stories that came through as headlines for us this afternoon, 10 days the December 7 general elections this afternoon. What factors will inform your choice at the polls? We went around the country to engage our correspondent. Also, Electoral Commission holds meeting with journalists aimed at equipping them ahead of the crucial December 7 elections. And we told you why the Mochoi Workers Association of Ghana is threatening to resume strike tomorrow to demand better conditions of service. Many thanks for joining us. Log on to 3news.com and get some more stories. My name again is Grace Hamwajiban. Thank you for joining us. Bismarck Kawisa is standing by to bring us the latest in the world of business. Good afternoon.
Hello, good afternoon and welcome to Business Daily on 3FM 92.7. Coming up, Bank of Ghana releases pricing guidelines for Ghana gold coin with the least portion of an ounce selling at a little over 11 cities. We'll bring you details. Also, Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ESA, warns against election-driven overspending to avert possible economic crisis as Ghana eyes post-2024 stability. We'll hear from its director, Professor Peter Corti. Trillion points. There's a lot in there. <laughs> All right. So, um, I think this is the 33rd edition of our report. Plus, parliamentary impasse over vacant seat delays, ratification of Ghana's lithium assets. We'll hear from Chief Executive of the Minerals Income Investment Fund, Edward Corantin. That disbursement is subject to ratification of the lease by parliament. Um, unfortunately, this has not happened yet. These stories and others lined up for you. Please stay. My name is Besmak Ausa. Now to the detail. The Bank of Ghana has released pricing details for the Ghana Gold Coin, a high purity gold investment product aimed at diversifying financial portfolios and mopping up excess CD liquidity. The coin comes in three sizes with varied pricing mechanism. The following three business news desk report has the details. The Bank of Ghana has this week announced pricing guidelines for the Ghana Gold Coin, a gold investment product introduced to broaden financial portfolio options for residents. The coin is issued and guaranteed by the Bank of Ghana and comes in three sizes, one ounce, half ounce, and a quarter ounce. An ounce of the gold coin is priced at 25,020 CDs, while half an ounce is selling at 22,409 CDs and a quarter ounce will cost 11,188 CDs. According to the central bank, the pricing is based on the London Bullion Marketing Association's daily auction price with transactions facilitated through commercial banks. Governor Dr. Ernest Addison says the initiative supports the central bank's domestic gold purchase program and aims to mop up excess liquidity in the financial system while providing Ghanaians with an alternative investment avenue. The Ghana gold coin is refined to 99.99% purity and can only be purchased in cities through commercial banks. And that was a three business news desk report on Bank of Ghana's release of pricing guidelines for the Ghana gold coin. To some other story, the total value of secured loans granted by banks and specialized deposit taking institutions, SDIs, in the third quarter of 2024 was 5.6 billion cities. This was relative to the 5.5 billion cities recorded in quarter three of 2023, indicating an increase of 2.8% on year-on-year terms. According to the th third quarter collateral registry brief, banks accounted for 3.5 billion cities of the total value of secured loans in quarter three, 2024, depicting a decrease of 18.7% from 4.3 billion cities in quarter three, in quarter three 2023. On the other hand, SDIs recorded a total value of 2.1 billion cities secured loans in quarter three of 2024, an increase of 75% from 1.2 billion cities recorded in the same period in 2023. Moving on, economist and director of the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ISE, Professor Peter Corte has cautioned against excessive spending during the 2024 election period, a trend often observed in the last quarter of election years. With economic challenges such as high inflation of 22.1%, a depreciating currency and slow industrial, industrial growth dominating pre-election discussions, experts stress fiscal discipline to avoid turbulence in early 2025. This comes as the government outlines cautious optimism for economic recovery under IMF-backed policies. If we look at the past where we tend to grow even faster in quarter three, quarter four, then we are likely to grow by 4% or even more in 2024, uh, all things being equal. We also saw that um, so far there's been fiscal consolidation. Uh, government based on the IMF program is very much on target 
in, in our fiscal. Uh, nevertheless, we hope the political business cycle, where in the last quarter of the year we tend to spend uh, beyond reasonable limits, and that will not recur. We've learned from our past mistakes and we'll stick to the course. So hopefully, if that happens, then uh, the first quarter of 2025 will be a smooth year. There wouldn't be much turbulence that we have witnessed uh, during uh, post-election years. That was economist and director of the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ISE, Professor Peter Corti, warning against election-driven overspending to avert possible economic crisis as Ghana eyes post-2024 stability. Now, the Minerals Income Investment Fund, MIF, has revealed that delays in ratifying Ghana's critical lithium assets in the central region are linked to ongoing parliamentary gridlock over vacant seats. Chief Executive Edward Corantin warns that the legislative uphold could jeopardize the country's efforts to capitalize on the booming global demand for lithium, a key mineral for renewable energy technologies. He also raised concerns over the delays impact on job creation in the region. We are working on the local asset, uh, which is the OER project. Uh, we have some few um, bits that we need to complete before we invest in that. We are looking at investing about $27.9 million um, in the local assets in the central region. Um, that disbursement is subject to ratification of the lease by parliament. Um, unfortunately, this has not happened yet um, because of going on in, um, in, in, in parliament, uh, which is delaying the project, um, unfortunately. Um, and could have an impact on job creation um, in, in, in central region. As we speak, Atlantic Lithium is actually the biggest taxpayer in the central region, even though it's not starter production. So again, it, 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 um, uh, you're able to take, we're able to place it in context about the importance of these investments, especially when it comes to job creation and revenue for the country. Meanwhile, the chief executive of the Minerals Income and Investment Fund, Edward Corantin, has also revealed that his outfit has listed Atlantic Lithium on the local bus after becoming the third largest shareholder in the company. The investment goes beyond just having these equity interests or what maybe our investment guys would call the return on investments, etc. It's the impact that we have on the Ghanaian economy, especially when it comes to industrialization. We've invested in lithium. So right now, uh, MIF is the third largest shareholder globally of Atlantic Lithium. Uh, we have invested in the global entity that is also listed in Australia and listed on the London Stock Exchange. Um, we've, we've um, as part of our investment, we've also had Atlantic Lithium listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange. And that was Chief Executive of Minerals Income Investment Fund, Edward Corantin. And that will be all for Business Daily on 3FM 92.7. For more business stories, please check out our website, 3news.com. I am Bismarck Aousa. Thanks for your company.